Welcome to Edinburgh and the world's biggest arts festival. Tonight, George R. R. Martin, creator of the worldwide TV phenomenon, Game of Thrones. Professor Mary Beard on the jokes that tickled the ancient Romans. Priceless pots from Ming Dynasty China. Strictly's Bruno Tognoli hot foots it around the festival's most dazzling dance shows. And music from flamenco legend Paco Peña. Now, think of a Ming vase and you're likely to conjure up an object of great rarity and value. But there's more to the Ming era than just exquisite porcelain. A new exhibition at the National Museum traces a period of great social, economic and artistic transformation. Lars Tharp, an expert in Chinese ceramics, guided me around. The Ming Dynasty ruled from the mid-1300s and was the world's largest and richest empire for three centuries. Known as the Golden Empire, it was a time when the arts flourished. The treasures in this collection tell of a cultural life which went far beyond the iconic blue and white vase. This beautiful scroll shows us the Forbidden City and this signifies the arrival, in a way, of the Ming Dynasty. It does in Beijing. It had arrived years before uh, down in Nanjing, which means southern capital. But the next emperor but one decided, no, I want to go up north. So he did a replica in Beijing of what they'd built in Nanking. And this represents something that actually is virtually unchanged today. It's one of the great spaces in any human culture. And this functions as a celestial, imperial, administrative capital for a, a good 700 years. I have a theory that in the minds of the people who designed this, as well as the people walking up that avenue, there was the Chinese character for central. It's a box with a line going through it, and the character says Zhong, and the Chinese for China is Zhong Guo, the central kingdom. Uh, it is the center of the center. And all around us is the universe that they created. Absolutely. The Ming was a period of huge social change and was run by a powerful, educated elite. So we have six very characterful portraits of clearly very important men. We're staring into the face of the Ming. These are amazing portraits. When I saw these, I thought it's very similar to the realism you get in the Hans Holbein pictures mm -hmm. of the inner court of the Tudors. These were the absolute top so-called literati. You're wondering, is he looking at us or are we looking at him? He was supposed to be one of the great connoisseurs of his time and told people what was good and what was not good in the artistic realm. To become a member of this elite scholar class, it was essential to pass a strict exam set by the emperor. The exams they were sitting were to show that they were competent in the Chinese classics, Confucius and others. And they had to demonstrate their skill at composition, but also through the use of the brush. Amongst this literati class, the mastery of brush and ink was essential, and the art of calligraphy was seen as the highest form of human endeavor. These are classic brush pots, the pots you keep your brushes in for writing letters for writing poems, and above all, for producing scrolls like the ones we see here. It's not the traditional round bamboo shape. No, it's made of bamboo, and I suspect to get it into that distorted form, uh, they probably put a girdle round a piece of bamboo whilst it was actually growing. It's carved to resemble a pine tree, and just underneath there are two cranes mm -hmm. which represent conjugal fidelity and long life. And this is carved by one of the most famous carving families of the Suzhou area. Um, one of those rare occasions where we actually know who the artist, the craftsman, who actually made this was. Uh, I mean, that's fantastic. That is a very, very important object. Amazing. The scholar artists using these pots were creating quintessential landscapes, of which there are a couple of stunning examples in this exhibition. But for me, 
the showstopper is an object so small it could easily be missed. It's two centimetres long. What are we looking at? Well, it's a little gold cicada sitting on a leaf. And it was found in a family tomb next to the skull of one of the buried family. The cicada is an emblem of long life, of immortality, in fact, because the, the larva lives underground for four years before emerging and then bursting out of its pupa, becoming this extraordinary bug. It's sitting on a simple leaf. Yeah. And the two materials, gold and jade, are two incorruptible materials. Jade is reckoned by the Chinese to be the purest form of matter. And gold, likewise, does not tarnish. Now you can see it looks as though it was made yesterday. And this is one of the most beautiful objects I've seen for a long time. The Ming Dynasty saw a shift towards a market economy, and amongst its chief exports were the unique ceramics of the day. Unsurprisingly, Lars has singled out an exceptional piece from this collection. Porcelain evolves in China, and the thing they like about porcelain is its white and its sparkles. Not only white, but also translucent. It's a domestic wine jar. With a beautiful, beautiful lid. And the lid is the thing that always disappears, but here you've got the whole thing. And it's a lid in the... Can you see the veins on top? So it's a leaf? It's a lotus leaf. And the little button on top is where they cut the stem off the lotus. So it's a beautiful wine jar. Everybody talks about Ming jars, mm -hmm. and they are usually referring to blue and white. And blue, as in this jar here, is achieved by putting cobalt onto the vase before you put the glaze on. It then fires, and it goes to that bluish colour. But at the same time, red. Red is the colour of the Ming. And they happen to discover that by putting copper oxide onto the piece, if you're lucky, it fires to this spectacular red colour. As the dynasty goes on, they are beginning to discover there are all sorts of other colours they can put on top of the glaze. Really very, very sophisticated production. In fact, there's a wonderful fish tank which is decorated with a lotus pond scene. And among the lotus ponds, there are three cranes. They are painted in underglaze blue. And when that stuff starts hitting Europe in the late 1500s into the 1600s, then, you know, Europe goes, what is this? We can't do this, and we couldn't do it for another 250 years afterwards. So we come to the kind of ultimate experience of the exhibition, and a map like none I've ever seen in my life before. I mean, it's laid out here electronically, but this is the real deal. This is a contemporary copy of the map presented by Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit who had based himself in China, hoping to convert the Chinese and showing the Chinese what the West knew of the entire world. A world which the Chinese thought was square, but which Matteo Ricci told them, no, it's a sphere, and this is a projection of a sphere. And what does that actually tell us about the rest of the world, or what does it tell us about the Ming Dynasty? This is a traditional European map where there is an attempt at scale, of relative scale. The Chinese weren't particularly interested in relative scale. Actually, if you go to Beijing today, you buy a Beijing map, it is impossible. They, you know, they only show important things are big and unimportant things are sort of off to the side. What does this exhibition reveal to us overall about the extent and the power and the kind of culture of the Ming Dynasty? Well, the Ming Dynasty is the last indigenous Chinese dynasty. So what we're seeing here, if you like, is the last gasp of indigenous Chinese society. The Ming begins to falter through various reasons uh, in the early 1600s, and it officially comes to an end in 1644. So what this exhibition represents really is the glory of the Ming. Yeah, yeah, and the taste. Ming at the Golden Empire is at the National Museum of Scotland until October.
Sean Keaveney is joined by Edinburgh veteran Alex Horne in his breakfast show coming live from Edinburgh all next week on BBC Six Music. Plus, Simon Mayer will be chatting to Russell Grant live from the Blue Tent at the festival tomorrow from 5 on BBC Radio 2. For more details of the BBC's extensive festival coverage, search for BBC Edinburgh Festivals.